This is Today in the News on Now Breakfast. The presidency says an investigation has been launched into the allegations of a transfer of the sum of 585.189 million naira grant into a private account. The amount is said to have been meant for vulnerable groups in Akwaibom, Cross Rivers, Ogun, and Lagos states. Beta Edu, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, has been implicated in the allegations leading to some civil society organizations who have called for her sacking. The Special Advisor to the President on Information and Strategy, Bayo Onanuga, says appropriate action will be taken once investigations are concluded. For reactions on this, we are joined by Kunle Lawal, the Executive Director of the Electoral College. Mr. Lawal, thank you for joining us on the conversation this morning. Uh, my first question would be, what are your reactions to this particular story, um, both from the uh, amount that has been mentioned here, as well as the reactions um, from the government to the allegations? Uh, good morning, Kamri. Um, it's always great to be here. Um, reactions, um, a little bit, um, how do I put it, disappointed, the whole matter. And I'll, I'll start from the beginning. First and foremost, she, um, the minister, Beta Edu, has come out to say that um, she's, she generally paid money into a private account, and that is breaking the financial regulations of governance. And it clearly stipulates that, um, that money should not be paid into a private account or money should not be paid into a, from a personal account into a government account. Um, and an officer who pays that public money into private accounts is said to have done that with fraudulent intentions, which means she's already broken a very, very strong um, principle. She's also broken the code of ethics for government worker, for uh, ministers or people serving with government. Um, it's it's sad to, to sh and shocking to see that even her statement admits to that, meaning she also does not understand that there are laws to the office she's she's in. But I think what's what's most scary about everything is the fact that um, the gov the the presidency feels they should have a thorough into investigation, uh, while she's still serving in office. For me, this totally breaks this totally breaks the 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 circle of, of, or the intention of the president to fight corruption. And she is not suspended, which also means that she's serving in office while, um, while um, being the jury, a judge and jury in her own case. Um, she, she also has broken the public trust of Nigerians by clearly stating that there was a database which, in which money was going to be transferred. She stated this on multiple news media, so I don't understand what exactly is going on and what and the presidency's lukewarm position on this matter. So, Mr. Lowell, if you can, because you have essentially stated in earlier posts on social media the procedure that should actually be followed in a case regarding this, uh, an amount as huge as this, including seeking permission from the Minister of Finance. Can you walk us through those steps? Okay, um, normally what would occur will be first, um, the Minister as of Humanitarian, that's Beta Edu, and then the permanent, permanent Secretary, and would probably um, co-sign that particular release of funds. It's above the amount stipulated for, um, for um, uh, what they call it, for ministers to approve. It's 585 million, it's far above how much a minister can approve. Um, the accountant general is supposed to be informed and the minister of finance is supposed to be informed. So there are three anomalies happening here. One, there was no, money was being paid into a private account. Two, no authority was sought from the minister of finance or president, which is yet to be seen. Three, a bank approved that amount into a private account without informing CBN, EFCC, or NFIU. And, um, and this, this all goes to show that there's, there's quite a mis total miscommunication between the system entirely. Mr. Lawal, some have called for the Accountant General to be investigated despite her statement distancing herself from this particular case. Do you agree with these calls? 
I don't understand how she's going to distance herself from this from the case. If we all if we all remember, um, um, government agencies all have accounts with the CBN. So it's from the, the funds emanated from the accountant general under the accountant general. So she can't claim to be indemnified from such an investigation. Mr. Lawal, thank you very much for speaking with us. Our guest this morning, Kunle Lawal, is the executive director of the Electoral College and he joined us to speak on the investigation into the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. The sum of 585.189 million naira was transferred into a private account. There are more conversations this morning on Now Breakfast. This is Today in the News on Now Breakfast. After months of persistent security threats from terrorist groups, Niger State Governor Umar Bago says farmers have returned to their farms. Governor Bago was speaking after a meeting with President Bola Tinubu in Abuja yesterday, where he offered to pilot the federal government's planned 500,000 hectares of agricultural production. Though the governor further described Niger as the leading state in terms of government's food security, Attacks on farmers and rural communities across the state are still present. For more on this, we're joined by Abukar Sadiq Akote. Mr. Akote is a journalist with Daily Trust in Niger State. Good morning and welcome to the conversation, Mr. Akote. Good morning. It's a pleasure to have you on. Let's start off with the government's statement. Uh, him saying that farmers are returning to the farms gives the impression that there is some measure of security that has returned to parts of Niger State. Can you speak to us on that? Uh, the, uh, good morning. Uh, farmers are truly uh, going back to their respective uh, community. Their respective community. Uh, the truth is, uh, is that in the last uh, couple of months, uh, attacks have reduced. Not that it has been completely shut uh because our bandits do come once in a while to carry out their attacks on communities. Uh, the, while the, we learned that uh, security operatives, conventional security operatives are on ground, uh, most efforts are the, the, uh, being made by communities on, on their own, uh, using their own local vigilantes and volunteers uh, uh, who protect them uh, against uh, attacks from bandits. Uh, not to the farmers are going back to their respective communities, uh, let me say, at their own risk. Uh, because uh, if you look at uh, areas like Shiroro, in the last uh, three weeks ago, a uh, resident told me that there was an attack in a community uh, called Alawa, where one of the vigilantes was even shot. Two farmers were killed by bandits, uh, which shows that uh, they still come once they were. And then, there's a forest around your area, which is called Alawa Forest. <laughs> and then the, the, there's a junction called Maganda Junction, uh, where a boundary uh, between Kaduna and Niger State, uh, which residents uh, uh, believe bandits live permanently uh, in that forest. And the group of them, not one group, many of them, many uh, group of bandits, many group of terrorists, Live, they still live in that uh, forest. But the forest is not accessible by even conventional security because of terrain. Then the vigilantes who are local from the local communities who know the terrain do not have the, the, the firepower to go there to fight those people. So the people are actually going back to their respective communities, having waited for long for government to intervene and then uh, uh, return their home. They feel they can go back and then see the outcome of their, 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 their decision. Sir, in September of last year, a report came out that uh, Governor Bago was looking to employ some 1,500 youths as forest guards. Do you know if this particular initiative has taken off at all? It has not taken off. I have not seen anything taking off of that nature. Well then. Um, 
So to, to, to move forward with the conversation, we're looking at more farmland uh, being farmed. And you've indicated that the farmers have waited for a while to see government intervention as far as security is concerned, but they have not seen this. Uh, w- what are the statements or what uh, moves has the, uh, state po- the, the police in Niger State made towards addressing the issues of insecurity? Has there been increased presence of security operatives on ground, uh, maybe patrolling through parts of Niger State? You know, you, you, you may recall... Uh, last administration uh, uh, said the challenge in Niger State, uh, uh, looking at the, the vastness of the land, the land mass the state has, the number of police personnel in the state are not even enough to, to, to police the entire state. Uh, I, I could remember the former SSG, Brian Martini, uh told us that um, you go to even this, um, so this community that were being attacked regularly by Dandy. You will go to some of those communities where your police are outposts with only two policemen being posted to a community that is being ravaged or a regular basis by bandits. So each time bandits uh, come to those communities, police said there are police on ground, one or two police on ground, or also join the, the locals in running and leaving the community. So the, the issue, the short and then the immediate task commission of police. Uh, who was just promoted to AIG and then he, he left uh, Niger in November last year, also made similar complaint that Niger can need more police force. He made he categorically say that some policemen were being posted out of Niger State without replacement. So, Mr. Okoti, if I may come in. Um, I mean, for the sake of our listener to give a perspective, Niger State is the largest state by landmass in the country, over 76,000 square kilometers. And I, I want to take you, Mr. Okote, back to a report you published sometime in, I believe this was October last year, where you referenced the number of farmers that were killed between April and September 2023 in Niger. 152 farmers lost their lives. 355 were kidnapped. You reported this based yes. on the government, the governor's commitment, putting Niger at the forefront of the federal government's plans for agriculture. Do you know whether the farmers themselves have demanded certain accountability from Governor or Governor Bago? You mean the you mean the expectation of farmers? Yes. You know, farmers are the that expectation has always been high, and the fact that the governor came. This man with a lot of pledges to, to fight the security, insecurity in the state and allow farmers go back to their respective farms, uh, having also recognized the uh, agricultural sector as one of its uh, priorities. Uh, the expectations are high from farmers. And they also, uh, his last uh, budget presentation, he made allocation to the sector, even though they have been concerned from farmers because uh, and not only farmers, even stakeholders, in the in the sector the the challenge is that um when it comes to intervention from government to farmers the the political farmers get more than the real farmers hmm. leaving the leaving the real farmers suffering at the end of the day because sometimes uh we as personal do wonder how government come up with a a, a, a list or a, a, a list of farmers benefiting farmers from government intervention. When you talk of all farmers' association, you are passing through farmers' association. If you go to rural areas, Niger State, I can say 70% of Niger State is a, a rural farmer, a rural area, right. and predominantly are farmers. Now, if you talk all farmers' association as an association to get across to real farmers in the village, if you go to those communities, I do enter because I do a lot of reports on agri. If you interact with some of these farmers, most of them don't even know anything about all the uh, African, all farmers association of Nigeria. Most of them don't even know anything about uh, poultry farmers association, PAN. So, and the people who claim to be farmers in the cities and towns who eventually collect uh, fertilizers, collect uh, 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 chemicals and other from government, and then stock them in their own warehouses and begin to sell at exorbitant prices to, to, to real farmers in the villages. Right. Well, so as I speak to you, I I was in, a, in some villages uh, to look at how 
uh, irrigation farming uh, is struggling. Most of those irrigation farming that is go that's going on in rural areas now in Nigeria are being done by the efforts of the farmers, not any support from government. Most farmers are Mr. now acquiring pumping machines on their own. Mr. Kote, I, I do apologize for cutting you short. Uh, we will pick up this conversation as developments happen. Our guest this morning is Abubakar Sadiq Kote, a journalist with Daily Trust in Niger State, talking to us about the state government's plan to have 500 hectares of, agri of land available for agricultural production. This is Now Breakfast. Dangote Group has put out a statement in response to the recent raid of its Lagos headquarters by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. The EFCC had requested details of all forex allocations to the company during the term of Godwin Emifele as governor of the central bank. Now, according to the company's account of the events, they had written to the EFCC seeking clarity on which of the companies under the Dangote Group was affected by the request, but their inquiry had gone unanswered. The statement also says that they had already delivered the first set of documents to the EFCC office, yet authorities had insisted on raiding the Dangote headquarters in, quote, a manner that appeared designed to cause us unwarranted embarrassment. Our guest on this is Radio Now's Boson or Mofaye, who joins us to discuss the implications and optics of this development. Hello, Boson. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much, Nabila. It's a pleasure to have you on. Let's start off Thank with you. your reaction to the statement by the Dangote Group. What do you make of it? Well, what I expect to have... Uh, thank you very much. What I expect to have heard from now, to have to what we ought to have as, as journalists right now, uh, and for the interest of the investors, both local and international, uh, and the uh, regulatory authorities, is to have a formal statement from... Uh, the EFCC over the weekend till this morning after this time, 7.30 a.m. Nigerian time, that information has not come out. That is not good by every uh, uh, stretch of imagination. That's not good enough for the EFCC. If you raid a corporate office, there has to be a public notice. If you raid it before, there's a, because there's uh, a need not to inform the public, as soon as you do it, you need to inform the, the public. Don't forget, the Dangote Group comprises of so many companies, at least about three or four of them are listed on, on the stock exchange. The Dangote Group issues, both local and international, uh, uh, the, the borrowing globally and, and, and locally in, in billions of, of naira and, and, and millions of dollars. So this is an international organization, even though it's, uh, it's an indigenous uh, Nigerian company. So... Investors need to know. The Securities and Exchange Commission needs to know. The Stock Exchange needs to know. Those who are bondholders need to know. Those who are holding the shares in some of the Dangote cement, Dangote flour, Dangote uh, sugar refinery, NASCON industries, they all need to know what is going on ASAP. So I think to an extent, uh, when the initial invite came to Dangote, uh, I was went through the media. We didn't have that news specifically from the EFCC, but the company was written to as a group. The group itself is not listed on, on the stock exchange, and I didn't get, and I'm speaking for myself, I didn't get that initial notice from the um, uh, uh companies that are listed on the exchange. I think that was wrong. If the EFCC had written to the group, and part of the group include companies that are listed on the exchange, they need to inform the public. However, the statement from the Angote, uh group came after what he described as a kind of a raid meant to embarrass, putting part of that statement now on Friday, uh, by the company and the group by uh, the EFCC. Uh, that is... Um uh, Bosin, uh, I, I apologize. Also, I apologize for interrupting you, Bosin. But you talk about the markets now. Following this particular raid, what did you see from the markets? How did it react to uh, this particular raid? No, the, the, the market is not going to react. Uh, 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 won't give what you call a knee-jerk reaction. It's not going to happen. The market will want to see. Uh, the Dangote Group is a company that is known to be very close to governments in the past. So uh, uh, I don't want to mention some other companies uh, in the past like that. But Nagote, it's been said, the immediate past central bank governor says it publicly, uh, that is close to, to, that, to the Angote uh, group, that uh, he believes that the Angote is doing 
industrial production in Nigeria is putting its boot on the ground, is creating jobs, is creating value, is in social corporate social responsibility that everyone in Nigeria can see. So to that extent, the uh, financial authorities, the market authorities in Nigeria have not hidden the fact that they are close to Dangote and its companies and vice versa. Mm. So that is an open front door that everybody in Nigeria knows. So it's, it's not today, not the last 10 years, not 15 years. But the market is not going to start marking down the share price of this company. Those who are listed on the exchange because of this FX uh, uh, investigation issue. The investigation is necessary. Mm. If there's need for it, it's been done in other clients, it's been done in the U.S., we've got it in South Korea, companies, uh, financial markets authorities, regulators would move in at any point in time to say, look, we're investigating, me. there is a, uh, what we have reason to believe something wrong had been done. That is down to banks, it's down to every other organization. So, uh, so Bosun, oh. let me ask you this. In light of what you've said and what we've seen are clear investments, particularly under the previous administration, um, whether it was support to the Dungote Group and what the Dungote Group has done for the economy, if he's saying that this was an attempt to embarrass the group and there's the political aspect to consider, what do you think this means for the future? I, I, I think we need to try not to set up ourselves for ridicule. And that is where we need to be very careful here. What you say is not only important, but how you say it is also important. Communication is important. Um, uh, we need to be very careful how what we do. And I started by saying that by now I expect the uh, EFCC to have responded clearly what actually happened. Based on what you read, which is in the public domain from the Angote Group, the spot said the set of um, uh, uh, documents were, were taken to the EFCC. What they said was that the EFCC at the same time sent its own men without letting them know to raid the office. They were not specific about what they were looking for in the company. We need to have... See, the EFCC is the agent of the federal government, of the authority and sovereignty of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So whether you are an investor in the Angote or not, or a consumer of his products, or you don't like him or the company, does not matter. They owe the Nigerian people front door immediate information. That also has been the public domain by now. It hasn't happened as at the time we we're holding this interview, to my knowledge. The Angote has responded as a private company. So it's the EFCC that is doing this investigation on behalf of the government, which represents each and every Nigerian woman abroad. So it has the right to hold an investigation. And I don't have any problem holding mm. such an investigation. However, we must communicate consistently. You have, they have allowed the company to go ahead and make a public information and say this is how we are being embarrassed. But the agency of the government is is yet to issue a statement. Right. That is not good enough. When the FBI raided the, the, the Mar-a-Lago facility of of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, former president, U.S. President uh, Donald Trump, look, you, you saw images. It was, on, it was on international news news channels. We all saw it. They said, this is how many boxes we have taken. If, if Dangote Group went there with boxes of, uh, of documents, how many boxes were delivered? Right. So you, we expect the EFCC to be on top of its own job. We like, well, I am personally, and I'm speaking for myself, the EFCC has done quite well in terms of going after those who do uh, uh, advance fee fraud and things of that nature. We saw it on the official Twitter handle almost on a daily basis. When they're investigating issues that had, therefore had to do with the Commonwealth of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Nigerians, which is the effect, which also involved the central bank, that raises the game to a completely new level. Now, well, international investors will be very keen watching how this is done before we damage, before we cut our nose to spite our face. So we need to be careful. So we need to communicate as and when you and communicate clearly about Bosun, our intentions and actions. Un- unfortunately, we are out of time, but you have uh, spoken quite emphatically on this, and perhaps it's a matter of time, and we'll see what, how the EFCC responds. But we want to say thank you for joining us and speaking to us on this. Our guest, Radio Now's Boson Omofaye, speaking on the implications of the EFCC raid on Dungote offices in Lagos, but also the Dungote Group's response in a statement which was uh, made uh, available to the public just yesterday. More than just the headline. This is News Extra on Radio Now 95.3 FM. 
Senegal goes to the polls in February to elect its fifth president in an election that will be keenly observed by Africa and the rest of the world. Incumbent President Macky Sall will not be seeking re-election, having reached the two-term limit decreed by the constitution of his country. But the eyes of the world are fixed on the country following the ruling by the Supreme Court of Senegal that upheld the ruling of a constitutional court barring Osmane Sonko, the main opposition leader, from being on the country's ballot. Radio Now's Stephen Imediagou speaks with Mamadou Chore. Mr. Chore is the president of the Council for the Observation of the Rules of Ethics and Professional Conduct in Dakar, the capital of Senegal. Mr. Chore starts by telling Stephen when the Constitutional Council of Senegal will announce the candidates for the 2024 presidential elections. Can you give us a quick overview of the preparations by the Electoral Commission and the readiness of Senegal as a whole for these elections? Yeah, thanks for having me. I I mean, uh, preparing this election, uh, we are waiting for a very key date, uh, meaning on January the 20th, when the Constitutional Council will announce those who will run really uh, for the next month's presidential election. For the time being, I mean, this council has been looking at what we call the sponsorship because this is the way it works in Senegal. Before you can run, you go to see uh, the the voters and then uh, something like a certain number of voters have to sponsor you. And uh, over something like uh, 93 uh, people did that. And at the, final, at the end of the day, uh, three three days ago, the Constitutional Council so far, uh, I mean, said that nine, nine out of 90, 93 succeeded in that. And there is a, another list of 20 more candidates we, who will get a, uh, which will get a second chance to come and try to, uh, to, to make it. The top name as far as opposition candidates are concerned is Usmane Sonko. And, um, he has been ruled out. Yeah, of this the, the top election. name. Uh, was, yeah, the, I mean, for for the ruling party is uh, the, since the president, the current president, cannot run again because he has done his two terms. He, um, I mean, chose his uh, current prime minister Amadouba, and, and on the opposition, everybody is waiting for Usman Sonko uh, to be uh, possible to run because he is in in uh, legal jeopardy, uh, meaning. Uh, three days ago, when the Constitutional Council looked at his file, they decided that uh, he cannot run. But, I mean, his lawyers decided to, to contest that decision coming from the Council. So we'll, ha- we'll have to wait uh, for the next, for the coming week to see if Usman Sonko uh, will be a candidate for next year's election. Because either he participate or not is a big news for what is coming next. Is there any specific reason as to why the Supreme Court in Senegal has prevented Mr. Sonko from running? In fact, it, it is not the Supreme Court. Is here we have what we call the Constitutional Council. So uh, they they said um, a lawyer who who is representing Sen- Sen- Sonko there that when they he, they look at, at his file, there is something missing, but they did, didn't tell him so far what is missing. But I mean, people are suspecting because we, when you look at the, the news in Senegal over the uh, last weeks, we 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 noticed that when Usman Sonko representative went to the, the body at the Minister of Home Affairs in charge of organizing election, they refused to give him, I mean, documents for him to go and look and get his sponsorship. But they, I mean, they they refused uh, radically, and when he brought the money. Uh, for the candidate to 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 be able to run, he get the same treatment. Those people say that they they won't give him the document showing that hey, he submitted that that uh, required money. So people are supposing that uh, maybe both documents because it's not a refusal. It's not uh, Osman Sonko didn't try to get it, but I mean the people in the administration refused to give him those documents, or uh, maybe that's what they consider that that is missing. And now the big debate is. Uh, if it's that those documents are the missing, are missing, it's not Usman Sonko guiltiness. It's the administration, uh, which is guilty in that situation.
does Mr. Sonko have any time to uh, surmount the legal hurdles in front of him before running for the elections? Yeah, it's the coming week. The coming week is a key week for all Mr. Sonko and, and all the candidates because there are 22 who has a second chance uh, to go and look uh, for more for sponsorship because the the one the 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 first sponsorship they uh, submitted the the number required they didn't I mean reach that number so it's we are entering a very key week because uh, uh the the, ne- the coming week will will uh, the, the council council will decide for for Usman Sonko and this other candidate twenty twenty two to be exact. Uh, could you That's talk to it. us as regards the um, coverage for these elections? What is the media community in Senegal doing towards preparing for the elections? Yeah, you, you know, Senegal, the, the press has been highlighted as doing doing a good job starting, uh, I mean, for this uh, change in power in, in 2000 when President Watt defeated uh, the incumbent day then, which was uh, President Abdijouf after 20 years in, in power. And then since then, we, we, we've covered uh, this will be the fifth uh, presidential election we'll be covering. And we have a chance here in Senegal, uh, the media, uh, on the day of the vote, when the, the ballots are closed uh, at six o'clock, uh, we are allowed to give, I mean, live the results when they become public, which is not the case in many African countries. So we, I mean, in behaving that way, we contribute in making the, this election transparent. And going to this uh, coming election, we won't change any, anything. But the, the problem we, we are witnessing is since March 2021, when this affair between Usman Sonko and that lady in the Biru Salon started, I mean, yeah, uh, the press has been attacked. Uh, and then the press sometimes is criticizing for being partial, being in favor of Usman Sonko, being in favor of Macky Sall, which is the current president. You, we sometimes do have hard times, but I mean, I mean, as a whole, the, the press in Senegal is very professional. And we as a body, uh, what, what the body I'm, uh, presiding over, I'm chairing is called correct. We are paying, uh, attention to the way the press is covering all of this. And if there is some, something to correct, we, we, we do that. We intervene and, and do that and, and do, and do, do it. Can you speak to the mood of the Senegalese people ahead of the elections? Um, what have been some of the conversations that the Senegalese people have brought to the media as things they will be looking out for in choosing the next president of Senegal? Yeah, most Senegalese want this election to be inclusive. We, it's mean, uh, people don't, don't want Usman Sonko to be out of the election. Because they consider that they, he represents, uh, I mean, mo- of, uh, a lot of Senegalese. And when you look at, uh, I mean, this, uh, justice cases is, he's involved in. So far, there is no final decision. Even if, uh, this, uh, defamation case, uh, the Supreme Court decided, uh, but, I mean, his lawyers said that, uh, there is, a uh, one last chance. And that, that's why they say, Usman Sonko can, can run again because for the other cases, uh, I mean, uh, the, this affair with the, the lady in the beauty salon. So there will be another, another trial and there are other cases, uh, which are not a done deal. So that's why when, when you look at people, they want this election to be a very open one. They will, don't want as they criticize the current president to select those who, who run because, uh, as I said it earlier, Usman Sonko taking part is the election of not taking part is a is something people are, are looking after because they consider that maybe he had big chance to become the, the fifth president of Senegal. But that, that is the decision for, for the voters. Nobody knows who will win, but he has big chances if he's uh, uh, allowed to run to win the next presidential election. That was Mamodou Chori, President of the Council for the Observation of the Rules of Ethics and Professional Conduct in Dakar, the capital of Senegal, speaking to Radio Now's Stephen Imediagou on the upcoming Senegalese presidential elections expected to hold next month, February 2024. And that's News Extra here on Radio Now 95.3 FM Lagos. Stick around in just a bit. 
You're still on to Now Breakfast on Radio Now 95.3 FM Lagos. My name is Stephen Ime Diego here with Nabila Usman. On our Newsmaker segment this morning, we're talking sports, specifically the AFCON 2023 and I know I said AFCON 2023, even though we are in 2024. And that's because this AFCON is, uh, it's been rescheduled. It was rescheduled to this year. And that's why we're still calling it AFCON 2023. But there are a number of issues when it comes to the AFCON. It's happening this month, the 10th. Uh, it's just over the beg your pardon. It's happening just past the weekend, um, running into the month of February. And there have been a number of developments since the AFCON was announced. Nigeria has qualified for the AFCON, but we are not without our nature of one day, one drama. We find ourselves with a short list of 25 players representing Nigeria at the AFCON, as against the 24 players, uh, 27 players that the AFCON regulations for this year says we can take to the competitions. We also find ourselves unable to watch the AFCON on our the more popular television networks because the broadcast rights for AFCON 2023 uh, have been won by New World TV, a small uh, television uh, broadcast company based uh, in Togo, Benin Republic. We also find ourselves um, curious as to the performance of the Super Eagles at the AFCON 2023. Now to answer these curiosities we have linked up with uh, a guest of ours a uh, seasoned journalist mr tana ayejino he's the editor of punch sports extra and uh, hopefully you'll be able to answer some of our questions this morning mr ayejino good morning and thank you for joining us on the conversation yeah good morning it's nice talking sports with you on this sunny um monday morning in lagos hope in- you guys are doing great Indeed, indeed. We're doing very well. Thank you. My colleague Nabila Usman is here as well. Um, I, I guess we should start. I don't know which of these issues, because there's a number of issues as regards to the AFCON that are of interest from the uh, broadcast rights to the Super Eagles shortlist, as well as um, the president, you know, basically coming through last minute to save our blushes. Um, I, I, I think we should start. They say charity begins at home. So let's start from home. We're taking 25 players to the AFCON, even though the regulations allow us to take 27. And I should add that um, unless Jose Peseria has made a new announcement, that looks like 24 because Wilfred Ndidi has been effectively ruled out of AFCON 2023. Why is the Super Eagles taking a lower number of players to the AFCON instead of, you know, the 27 players that the regulations say we can bring to the games? Yeah, I think um, it's, uh, the coach is in the best position to answer that question because actually expected us to exploit um, that extra two spot that we should have uh, um, 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 made very good use of. Um, if we weren't going to give it to the overseas base player, then I think we should have given it to the NPFL player. Um, even if you are not going to play them, um, they will understand what it means to play football at the continental level. You know, they will, they will be able to mix up with the staff. They will be able to mix up with some of the big players they see on TV, just like you and I. And at the end of the day, they will be able to bring him back that experience into the domestic, uh, into the domestic league. But well, coach, uh, the manager Jose Moreno, uh, sorry, uh, Jose Pesero, understand why he actually took 25 of those players. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a critic of his. He's the coach. Um, he knows um, why he's taking uh, 25 players. But of course. Um, like I stated earlier, I should have expected him to take 27 of the players to the AFCON. We have quality players in the domestic league. Nobody's looking their way. Divino Wachiku is a fantastic player. We had Amas Obasoge also um, in the domestic league, fantastic keeper. We also, had, also have Kingdom Usai, who's really done well this season, you know, and we expected that this young lad would have been uh, a chance on the international scene. Now we are not having all of that. Now those two slots. Um, are just there, um, live follow, and we are going to the African with 25 um, um, players who the coach feel will be able to do the job for him. Yes, we friendly did it out, but he's been replaced by um, Al Hassan Yusuf, uh, who played for the uh, Belgian champions Antwerp. Uh, he's a fine young player too, and uh, hopefully he may be able, he will be able to cover up for NDD, who will know he's our number one Trojan. Do you think that do you think it puts us on a significant back foot when you compare us to some of the other national teams that are competing? 
Yeah, do I think? Do you think it puts us on a significant back foot compared to the other teams that are competing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. Yes, I, I should think so because yes, uh, it would definitely put us on the back foot if um, a team is going with the full um, number of players. What it definitely means is that even if all of them are not going to play, they are going to learn lessons from the competition. For crying out loud, this is Africa's show peace football competition. And uh, we expect, you know, some of uh, the players who might not even play to get the feeling, to get the experience, to know what it means to play at that level. So definitely going to put us on the back foot because we have not properly utilized uh, the spaces that were given to us. It's the first time we're having a 27 month uh, considered at the, at, the, at the tournament. And so when we tell ourselves that don't need this extra two, what it means is that we're just throwing those sports away and for me, it's not the best for us. You've extensively covered the Nigeria Professional Football League. I wonder if the argument that we don't see the uh, Nigerian League on television it lends any weight to Peserio's um, decision to not take players from the home base front. Is it that he hasn't seen the players or he just hasn't watched any of them? Well, I remember the last post minister from the diary insisted that Pesero was going to live in Nigeria. He was going to paid in. He was going to be paid in Naira, and he was going to go from much venue to the others. And at some point in the media, it was I watched pictures and videos of him going to um, uh, MPFL match venues, watching games and all of that. But eventually, nothing came out of it. What we have are Europeans who just relax, watch TV, look at one or two players abroad, and then bring them into the national team and forget the domestic league. And that's why, you know, the league is in the state where it is. I can imagine myself being a professional player in the domestic league, and I know that if I score a million goals, it will get me to the Eagles. What does that mean? It tells you that I will never you know, be happy with the situation of change. And that's what the domestic league players are facing. We have fantastic players here who could have been able to get the right experience at the AFCON. If you recall in 2013, Sunday Umba, the domestic league player was with, I think, the Nugu Rangers at the time. Right. You know, was the one who got us the, the, the winner in the final against Burkina Faso. He also got us the winner against Ivory Coast, who we are thought we had lost to in the quarterfinals of that competition. So what it tells you is if you give the domestic league players, the MPSL, players the chance they will grab it but you know consistently we keep seeing european and even local uh, coaches coming to the team and then sideline you know these players I'm, I'm really not happy with it and all the time i keep saying charity should begin at home we must start looking at players yes we understand the conditions they play poor pitches um um welfare packages as well very poor and all of that but we've got the talent that doesn't take the talent away from the league so we need to explore that aspect and then help these players grow mm. the only way we can actually say we have a true national team majority of the players um coming to this afcon or rather teams coming to the afcon have a lot of domestic league players in their squad we have just one a goalkeeper and for me that is that is it's very, very unfair to the MPFL. So, Mr. Yejino, I, I want to move your attention now to the continental scene. Well, I, I guess in many ways it still affects us quite intimately. The issue of the streaming rights that were won, won by New World TV, we already know the controversy. A very small uh, broadcasting firm. It doesn't have presence in most of the countries in on the continent. Much of its presence is in Francophone-speaking uh, countries in yeah. Africa. How do you expect, yeah. or perhaps we should even start with what you just expect to be, um, not the backlash, but the outcome in terms of making sure something like this doesn't happen again? Yeah, um, a lot of football followers on the continent are really not happy with the last minute on situation of things. Uh, for me, I also have a pay TV. Um, I wouldn't want to mention the name. Where I had expected them, um, I'll watch the competition from. But unfortunately, this isn't happening. Uh, what it means that followership of the competition at the end of the day my job. We are expecting a large uh, number across the world to watch it. But you see, in Africa, we always have issues. And last minute, we, we fail to get, to, to get it right. So I think the the book type rights issue should have been sorted long before now and not when the competition is just a uh, um, few days away. You know, it, it took quite a lot of us, you know, are back. I'm one of the fans of the competition. I was hoping to easily sit down in my living room and watch it with my family, but the way it is now, um, it, it definitely means we're, we're going to find um, 
uh, other venues. I know it's the same story for all the football followers, you know, um, who had wished that they could watch it the same way I had wished. Right. It's interesting that um, people in the United Kingdom will actually be able to watch the AFCON 2023 live. But Africa that uh, hosts this tournament, Africa that you could say this tournament belongs to, will not be watching it. What do you think went into the decision to award this the, the broadcast rights to a different company than the one that traditionally for the last, I would say, three, four um, editions of AFCON has been showing the matches? I, I wouldn't really be able to say um, what I mean. What, what led to the decision? Because um, um, those who we had expected were going to broadcast the competition live, uh, even though they issued a statement, they didn't really say what um, happened that led to uh, you know what, where, where we find ourselves now. But the, the truth of the matter is, that, um, you know, somehow the reverse is always the case in Africa. So this is not surprising. We live at domestic leagues, and then we watch European leagues. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't watch our showpiece competition, then it's showing in Europe. So, it's, it's a kind of not being able to get our acts right over the years, and it's coming to show. I guess, yes, those who will be airing it, you know, in other parts of the world, actually did their timing, their calculations, and everything, they did the full details of everything they needed to do, they got it right, and it, it, it worked for them. And so, at the end of the day, they have um, the right, it can broadcast it. But down here in Africa, you know, the, the, the reverse is the case, like I stated earlier. Mr. Yeji, you know, I, I want to take yeah. you back to to AFCON's posturing, right? Just based on everything that we've said now concerning the streaming rights and the limitations of this firm, do you see enough body language from, for instance, uh, CAF president Patrice Motsepe that says that they will make sure this doesn't happen again? Do you see enough body language that's saying that they are even conscious that, you know, something like this was allowed to occur? Yeah, I, I think this this might not happen again because um, um, it took even even cast the Confederation of African Football by shock, by surprise. Um, there's been a backlash, there's been an outcry. Um, you know, football crazy fans aren't happy. Uh, it's part of those learning processes. I think uh, CAF should really learn from. If, if you look at uh, Mosefe, even though he had um, a club, a football club before he came into a uh, CAF, he was actually a businessman. And you know, businessmen, businessmen rather, sorry, love details. And they always want details to be finely tuned. What I mean by this is, you know this is what you want, you have to go for it, and then you have to do everything that will make it work. Why didn't it work? I'm not, I'm not having issues with, with Mosafir at all. But what about the cast media department? What did they do about all this? Who are those handling the broadcast right? By now we should hear that heads are rolling. Because you are depriving the continent of their showpiece competition. And for me, this shouldn't be the case. By now, there should have been a statement from CAF saying this, this, uh, this person or that person or whoever didn't do their jobs well. And they have to either get suspended or go or pay for it one way or the other. That is the way to go. But when you make these mistakes and the same people remain, yes, there's a probability that it could reoccur once again. So you have to show people that if you have a job, if you have a role to play, then you must play very well. This is embarrassing to the entire African continent, even to me, who is not even involved in any of the uh, the processes, you know, on the way to the competition itself. So I think we really need to, to dig in deep, bring out those who, if, if actually that's what happened, and then see how they get uh, punished for, 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 for also punishing, so to speak, you know. Uh, football followers on the continent. Well, Mr. Ayyajana, thank you very much for speaking with us. Um, this will, Hopefully, we'll find a way to watch these games because we need to see what the, the Super Eagles will do. Yeah, definitely we will. Thank you for your time. Our guest this morning is Mr. Tana Ayyajina. He is the editor for Punch Sports Extra and he joined us to speak on the AFCON 2023, which will not be shown on the regular channels as the broadcast rights have been won by New World Television. He also tried to shed some light as to why he believes that um, the coach of the Super Eagles chose to take nobody from the uh, Nigeria the Professional Football League to the AFCON, which is holding in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, these conversations will continue. There is another sporting conversation for you to look forward to a little later this morning on the Midday Show. But for now, 
we put a pause in it and when we come back the conversation continues right here on now breakfast you stay with us